parenthood teaches a lot of things. Compassion, responsibility, and most of all, sacrifice. The safety and well-being of your children is a parent's top priority. Laura Ackerson, a successful businesswoman, was a month away from finally getting full custody of her children, and things were looking up for her. But on the fateful day of July 13th, 2011, Laura was nowhere to be found. Did she abandon her children? And would she really abandon everything and everyone when she was so close to the end of a messy custody battle? Or had something gone terribly wrong? Laura Jean Ackerson was born on April 30th, 1984 to parents Roger and Brenda Ackerson. Growing up, Laura was a cheerful and happy kid with an outgoing and fun personality. She also attended the Grace Fellowship Church with her family and was an absolute sweetheart and gentle soul. Now, not a lot is known about her early childhood, but Laura's perfect family crumbled to bits in 1996. See, her parents couldn't stand each other and constantly fought. And as a result, Laura was just 12 years old when her parents got divorced. The separation was a major blow to Laura's emotional state, and ever since then, she was emotionally insecure. Divorce is something no child should have to go through, and Laura's case makes this particularly obvious. Following the divorce, Laura and her mother Brenda moved to Iowa, and Laura attended Linville Sully High School, and then attended Kirkwood Community College to study graphic design. Laura had a sharp eye for art and creativity, and she was amazed at expressing herself with different colors, patterns, and digital art. Not long after, Laura moved to Kinston, North Carolina to start fresh, where she attended J.Y. Monk Real Estate School. She started working in marketing and graphic design and also made new friends, specifically in Raleigh, with her business partners Siobhan Moffs and Heidi Shoemaker, who soon became Laura's best friends. Laura loved the fact that she had permanent friends because growing up, she was always alone and didn't have any contact with her old friends since she moved around a lot. She was ecstatic that she'd finally found her tribe. One night at a local restaurant in March of 2007, Laura met a man, Grant Hayes. Grant was born on the 30th of April, 1979 in Raleigh, North Carolina. The fact that Laura and Grant had the same birthday was one of the things that the pair bonded over. Not much is known about Grant's childhood either, but what we do know is that he was religious, had an act for making music, and became locally famous, working small gigs in bars and restaurants. Grant was a charming guy and knew how to woo the ladies. When he was 18, he graduated high school and met and fell in love with a woman named Emily Lovers. The relationship escalated fast, and before you knew it, they were married. But the marriage fizzled out as quickly as it peaked and they got divorced which was a significant point in Grant's life because Emily was his muse. He wrote songs about her and was inspired by their relationship. But when all of that came tumbling down, well, so did Grant. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and depression. He was prescribed very potent drugs like lithium, but soon he started to turn to alcohol and dabbled in much harder substances as well. It was pretty clear that Grant couldn't function without these drugs, and he was already paving his way towards a dark road but when he got addicted to a synthetic hallucinogen, things only took a turn for the worse. He was already egotistical and narcissistic, but suddenly he got more violent and manipulative. Grant also started to have delusions. He believed that aliens ruled the government and that he was a quote, chosen one, and that he needed a spaceship to survive the apocalypse. He also didn't believe in vaccination and immunization because he believed they caused autism. I'm gonna love seeing the debates in the comments about this one. Somehow with all of these delusions and drug abuse, Grant's music career picked up and he got frequent gigs in Raleigh around the same time that he met Laura. But while to the outside world, things appeared to be going perfectly for Grant, this was far from the truth. And Laura would soon find herself on the receiving end of Grant's abuse and controlling demeanor. Grant was physically and emotionally abusive towards Laura, and he also repeatedly cheated on her. Laura, already being emotionally insecure, let Grant walk all over her, and he even tried to isolate her from her friends and family, calling them a bad influence. Grant, being a complete textbook narcissist, wanted to control every single thing about Laura, from what she did, where she went, to who she met, everything. Shockingly, despite everything that went down, Laura and Grant got married after just a couple months of dating. 
Laura, belonging to a broken family and having very tainted experiences with relationships, wanted to find her happily ever after. Still, tragically, she ended up with Grant, a person who didn't think of anyone but himself. To give you an idea about the level of control Grant had over Laura, no one knew that Laura was even in a relationship. And when she broke the news about her being married to Grant, it's safe to say that Heidi and Laura's closest friends got the shock of their lives. But even though it was a horrible idea, Laura's friends supported her along the way. A couple of months after that, Laura fell pregnant. She was deliriously happy about this, and you would think that Grant would be too. But that wasn't the case. Grant hated the idea of becoming a dad. Laura getting pregnant was like adding fuel to the fire, and Grant became even more obsessive and controlling. Nine months later, Grant Jr. was born, and he was everything Laura's world revolved around. And just to further exemplify how narcissistic this man was, he even went as far as giving his son his own name. And don't get me wrong, this isn't done in some narcissistic way. In most cases, it's an endearing tribute to a father or grandfather, but in Grant's case, eh. Regardless, Laura loved her son to pieces. And meanwhile, Grant was busy getting high, cheating on the mother of his child, and taking on work gigs, not giving his son any time of day. Eventually, one of Grant's connections told him about a job opportunity in the Virgin Islands. Grant enthusiastically agreed to this opportunity, leaving his wife and infant son back in North Carolina. Now, I don't know about him finding work, but he sure met someone there who kept him busy. A woman to be exact, and her name was Amanda Perry Tucker. Amanda was a struggling actress and a single mother, having landed a few uncredited roles in movies and TV shows like The Sopranos and Stepford Wives. Grant immediately took a liking to Amanda, mainly because she was wealthy and had almost $200,000 in cash and $80,000 worth of jewelry, possibly as alimony for her prior divorce, but we don't know this for sure. Meanwhile, Grant, at the time of meeting Amanda, was completely broke. The two quickly got into a relationship, and Grant finally had something over Laura that he could rub in her face. He openly cheated on Laura with Amanda, ridiculing her to no end. But Grant couldn't have expected what Laura did next, as she finally had enough, something Grant thought would never happen. Laura was fed up and decided to draw the line. She announced that she wanted to leave Grant for good. Grant's own family, and even his ex-wife Emily, sided with Laura, telling her to leave him as soon as possible, as they knew how controlling Grant really was. But Laura found out that she was pregnant with her second child. And even though Grant didn't deserve it, she decided to give him a second chance. But really, this is probably more like Grant's ninth or tenth chance. It goes to show how much Laura adored her children, and was always willing to put them first. It also just goes to show how badly the divorce of Laura's parents must have affected her, as she was now willing to go to the ends of the earth to never become the victim of a divorce for a second time, even if it meant wrecking her own mental health to do it. Understandably, pregnant Laura decided to move to the Virgin Islands with Grant Jr. to be with her husband, a fact that Grant didn't appreciate at all, as she would now have eyes on him 24-7. Fast forward to Laura's second son, Gentle, and he was born. Unfortunately, he had a lot of health issues at birth, and the family needed to be close to a better health facility to monitor him. Ultimately, the Hayes family moved back to North Carolina, and you guessed it, Grant was furious. He blamed everything on Laura and the children, that he lost lucrative work opportunities and that they had forced him to move out of the Virgin Islands. Everything was their fault. All the while, Amanda was still in contact with him, and she even moved to New York and convinced Grant to explore the industry there. We all know by this point that Grant just wanted to be close to Amanda and away from Laura and his children because he didn't want the responsibility. Grant eventually moved to New York, and he loved it there. There was a lot of work for him to get involved in, and he was close to Amanda, which seems to have been priority number one. He even asked Laura if he could take Grant Jr. with him for a diaper photo shoot, promising to return him immediately afterward. Laura was initially hesitant, but she let him go in the end because she wanted the kids to have a good relationship with their father. But little did she know, Grant had other malicious intentions. See, when Grant didn't return Grant Jr. as promised, a concerned Laura checked Facebook, and she was shocked by what she discovered. Grant had married Amanda in New York, married her, and they were living together with Grant Jr. Just let that sink in for a moment. The sheer terror that Laura must have felt in that moment, I can't even fathom. Laura was obviously distraught, and she called Grant to confront him. 
but she was about to get another incredibly bizarre surprise. Grant revealed to Laura that he and Laura were never legally married to begin with, and when a confused Laura checked her marriage certificate for confirmation, her suspicions became a true nightmare. Grant's signature was missing from the document, and if he thought this was bad enough, there's more. Grant and Amanda had filed for emergency custody of Grant Jr., and since technically Laura and Grant weren't married and there were no custody agreements made beforehand, Laura lost the custody of her two children. And get this, all of this happened without Laura even knowing. Grant showed up to these hearings alone and testified that Laura was an unfit mother because she was a full-time mom with no house and no job. The court, without even hearing Laura's side of the story, gave full custody to Grant. It was unbelievable. How could a person take a child away from their mother without so much as hearing the other side of the story? I'm just going to be honest about this. A lot of these cases, they get me a bit worked up. Truthfully, I get pretty emotional when working on nearly every one of these videos, but when hearing what Grant did to Laura, it made me physically sick. But the thing Grant didn't know was that Laura was a fighter, and she was going to do everything to get her kids back. Shortly after, she presented evidence in court that showed that Grant was abusive and a sociopath. Because of these new findings, the court decided to have psychiatric evaluations for both parents. And in the meantime, Laura could have the kids on the weekends, and she could talk to them on the phone every day. But Grant and Amanda, who was pregnant at the time with his child, ruined these precious moments for Laura. They would often interrupt her calls with them, and she barely got more than a couple of minutes to speak to her children throughout the week. Laura was beside herself and overwhelmed, but she still had her best friend Heidi by her side, with whom she shared everything. Laura even shared a very chilling detail with Heidi in the midst of the custody battle, that if anything were to happen to her, it would be Grant's doing. This is terrifying to hear, no matter the circumstance. But remember the psych evaluation ordered by the court? Well, Grant failed it miserably. He had no bond with the kids, and they actually preferred Laura's presence, go figure. Laura was also shown as a tender and affectionate mother, who always looked out for her boys, no matter what. In light of this, the court ordered a detailed evaluation of Grant, and around the same time, Amanda, Grant's new wife, gave birth to a girl, Lillian, on June 9th, 2011. Things were eventful as far as the custody was concerned. The court ordered a 3-2 schedule for the parents, in which one parent would get the kids for three days, the other would get them for two days, and then they would switch up. But to say that Grant was nearing his breaking point by now, well, that's, that's no joke. He became extremely angry and agitated. And soon, very tragically, everything came crashing down. On July 13th, 2011, just a month before the next custody hearing, Laura was supposed to have a business meeting with her friend and business partner, Siobhan, later that evening. But she didn't show up or even call. Siobhan thought that this was strange, but decided to let it go because he knew that Laura mentioned that she was going to have to meet with Grant and get her boys at his apartment on that same day. Cell phone records showed that Laura had texted Grant that she was on her way, although she didn't get a reply from him. Anyway, after five days of no contact with anyone, 27-year-old Laura was officially reported missing by her friends and family on July 18th. Police officers immediately went to Laura's apartment and found it in ordinary condition. CCTV footage also showed Laura leaving her apartment, but she never returned. They went to Grant and Amanda's apartment in Raleigh next, which was almost 90 minutes away from Laura's, with a search warrant, and they immediately noticed something was very wrong. Not only were Grant and Amanda not home, but upon entering, officers were struck with a very strong smell of bleach, which is never a good sign in a crime investigation. The space was immaculately clean, and officers also noticed some things missing from the apartment. A shower curtain, a vacuum cleaner, and a couple of rugs were missing, and there were bleached patches on the floor too. Police also found two pieces of paper, both of which were equally appalling. The first one was a song that Grant was working on, titled Man Killer. The song's lyrics entailed a woman getting brutally killed by strangulation. The other piece of paper was a letter that had Laura's handwriting and signature on it. It was an agreement of sorts between Laura and Grant, and that she would give up custody of her boys for $25,000. 
Now, this is immediately fishy for anyone who knows Laura, because the kids were her universe, and she would never give them up for money. On top of that, the custody battle had nothing to do with money, at least not for Laura. She truly just wanted her kids with her. The police knew that they needed to track Grant and Amanda down before it was too late. Through CCTV footage, the police found out that Grant and Amanda had been in the midst of a lot of activity after July 13th. Amanda was seen with the kids at a local Chick-fil-A. Meanwhile, Grant went shopping in the early hours of July 14th to a Walmart and a Target in Raleigh. But the things that Grant bought were extremely alarming. He purchased goggles, trash bags, a reciprocating saw, blades, bleach, tape, and a lint roller. Now, I don't know about you, but if this doesn't scream suspicious, I don't know what will. Amanda, on that same day, called her daughter Shaw and told her to take the kids and look after them for a good chunk of the day. Then on July 16th, Grant made another purchase at a local store, and this time he bought lots of ice and coolers. Shortly after, he rented a U-Haul trailer, and he and Amanda and the two boys went to Richmond, Texas because Grant wanted to take Amanda for a visit to her sister, Karen Barry. They arrived sometime around July 19th. But interestingly, Grant made yet another purchase at a Home Depot, and he bought heavy-duty gloves and eight bottles of acid. The police were obviously concerned by all of these details, and they decided to make a trip to Texas to talk to Amanda's sister, Karen. She had a lot of things to say, which further shocked the officers. Karen said that on the night of July 19th, Grant and Amanda had asked her to borrow a boat to go to Oyster Creek, a deep canal with a lot of vegetation murky waters, and tons of alligators. Karen and her son, Sheldon Barry, also recalled the strange questions that Grant and Amanda asked, like if the alligators of Oyster Creek ate humans, if wild hogs ate human flesh, and if there were bloodthirsty sharks in Texas. Karen and Sheldon chalked these questions up to the morbid curiosity of city folk visiting the countryside. But the police knew that the odds weren't looking good for Laura. Upon hearing this, the police jumped into action. A team was sent to Oyster Creek to look for any evidence, and another team went on to scout for CCTV cameras in Texas, and both hit a jackpot. But sadly, what the police were dreading came true. In Oyster Creek, after hours of treading through murky and dangerous waters with endless lily pads, officers found, well, most of Laura. It's just so tragic and heartbreaking to think that she was going to meet her children, but she fell straight into the hands of such a vicious monster and was dehumanized to the extreme. This vile man literally turned her into fish food. Her remains were so badly damaged that an official cause of death was an uphill task to figure out. But it was eventually concluded that she'd passed away either by manual strangulation or a strong blow to the back of the neck. If you think back to Grant's so-called song that he wrote, everything was just so barbaric and it proves that Grant had planned on taking Laura's life all along. Chief Deputy Brady, who was on Laura's case, termed the scene as the most gruesome one of his career in 30 years. Police knew for certain that Grant and Amanda were behind the horrific passing of Laura, and their suspicions were solidified on July 20th, 2011. Laura's car, a 2006 white Ford Focus was discovered near Grant's apartment parked in a haphazard way. The inside of the car was washed and there was also damage to the rear end of the car. On top of that, CCTV footage of Amanda dumping bottles of acid near Karen's home was also discovered. On July 25th, 2011, just 13 days after Laura went missing, Grant and Amanda were arrested from Grant's parents' house in North Carolina. And they were charged with taking Laura's life. Grant and Amanda were tried separately, and in true perpetrator-accomplice fashion, both parties turned against each other. Grant said that Laura came to the apartment on July 13th and was apparently threatening Amanda with taking her daughter away, just like how her sons were taken away from her. And that caused Amanda to lash out and attack Laura, ultimately leading to her demise. Grant supposedly only helped to get rid of Laura's body. Meanwhile, Amanda's defense was built on the fact that Grant was very abusive towards her, and she didn't know anything about Laura's passing until they reached Texas. According to Amanda, on July 13th, Laura was visiting Grant and her kids, and during a verbal altercation with Grant, she fell and hit her head. 
something that Amanda conveniently didn't notice, as she was in the other room with the kids. Anyway, Grant came in and told Amanda that she needed to leave with the children while he could call an ambulance, as Laura was hurt pretty badly. Amanda did as directed and went to Chick-fil-A, and when she came back, Laura was gone and Grant was in the living room. Grant told Amanda that Laura was fine and didn't need an ambulance after all, and that she just went home. Fast forward to the couple reaching Texas, and Grant confessed to Amanda that Laura had indeed passed away. Grant then proceeded to threaten Amanda to help him dispose of Laura's body, to which she agreed because, well, she was afraid of him. Both Grant and Amanda pleaded not guilty, but there was an overwhelming amount of evidence against them. And finally, they were both found guilty and both convicted. On September 16th, 2013, Grant was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. What's so eerie and disgusting is the fact that Grant showed no remorse for heartlessly attacking Laura and taking her life, and he was all smiles in court. It was as if nothing had even happened, almost like he was preparing to go away on a vacation or something. This man just, he doesn't even make any sense. After a few months, on February 19th, 2014, Amanda was sentenced to 13 to 16 years. At the sentencing, the judge had a very valid opinion about Amanda and her hand in Laura's passing. He said, quote, I personally believe, based on my view of the evidence, that it's quite possible and likely that Amanda Hayes could have saved the life of Laura Ackerson, and she chose not to. She chose instead to participate in her killing. Amanda, at the sentencing, was remorseful, but it could have just been her acting skills coming forward, because she had every chance to prevent the brutality that Laura went through. But she didn't stop anything. But the thing is, the prosecution was nowhere near done, because Amanda was tried again in Texas for tampering with evidence, and she was given an additional 20 years in prison. Now, the question was, how did the deadly duo actually attack Laura that led to her passing? And what was the reason? Police believe that Laura was lured into Grant and Amanda's apartment on the pretense that she would get to meet her children. It's also believed that Grant lied to Laura about giving her full custody of the children. See, Laura would have never met Grant alone under any circumstances, and even her friends forbade her from doing so. So the only plausible reason as to why she was willing to take a 90-minute trip from Kingston to meet Grant was to see her kids. It's just so heartbreaking now to see how excited Laura was to meet her kids, and she had no clue that Grant had no intentions of letting her leave alive. But what about the letter that was in Laura's handwriting about handing over the custody to Grant? Well, it's believed that once Laura reached the apartment, she was subdued by Grant and Amanda and forced to write the letter and even sign it. Grant probably threatened Laura that if she didn't do what he said, then she would never see her sons again. After writing the letter, she was very tragically attacked, but this is more or less just a theory. We don't know that this is what happened for sure. All we know is that Grant seems to have been doing all of this so that he could take Laura out of the picture for good and begin his new life with Amanda. But that's where things get even worse. After all of this, in October of 2014, Amanda and Grant got divorced. For Grant, all of his trouble, all of this effort, it had now been for nothing. Laura's two sons, Grant Jr. and Gentle, along with Amanda's daughter, Lillian, are now in the care of Grant's parents, who are every bit of loving and caring, unlike their father was. It's so sad to see that the two boys were robbed of their mother at such young ages, much less by their father and his manipulative ways. Laura, even after her parents got divorced, was still in contact with her father, Roger, and her brother, Jason. Roger wished that he could have given a better life to Laura, and because of his and Laura's mother's rocky relationship, Laura never truly got to know what love was and was trapped with a narcissistic monster. Roger, after multiple failed marriages, suffered from tremendous heartache, and to see his youngest daughter pass away in such a tragic and devastating way was just unbearable. Roger spent his days in his busy antique store, Collector's Corner Shop, in the historic district of Lowell, where he envisioned Laura as the marketing director of the business if she'd been alive and well, but those dreams were eventually taken away from him. While trying to get custody of Grant Jr. and Gentle, Roger, at the age of 75, unfortunately passed away on February 18th, 2021. This case was heinous on so many levels. Laura, a loving mom, responsible daughter, and devoted friend, was so full of life and so sweet and caring, 
yet she was taken away so savagely by the father of her own children. It goes to show just how important self-respect is in a person's life. You should never be afraid of standing up for yourself. Don't let yourself be a doormat for others, no matter how much you may love them. It's never too early to start with a clean slate, but unfortunately for Laura, she was just too late. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below down near the description to support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.